Hello and welcome to The Primary Storyline, a video series about post-production as it relates to Final Cut Pro 10, Motion, and Compressor. My name is Andrew Gormley and I will be your host. The first thing I would like to do is just say thank you so much for all of the emails and tweets of both support and requests for the podcast. It really, really means a lot. It was a little overwhelming, to be honest, in a good way, in a super good way. A special thank you to fcp.co for somehow finding this. I have no idea where they could have found it. If you try to search for Final Cut Pro 10 in Apple's podcast directory, there are probably 400 things above this one. So however they found it, thank you. It is a great site. I am there pretty much daily. Again, it's fcp.co. It's everything we talk about here and more. It's just great content. Go there, subscribe, do all that stuff. I'm also compiling all of the info I received together into a reader mailbag episode where I can talk about some of the tips you sent me. But I want to address the top three requests up front in this episode. And then I swear we'll get to some retiming stuff and it'll be great. So the number one request, not surprisingly, was 1080p for the resolution. And that seems like a no-brainer, but I wasn't sure how bandwidth would work and if I would have to pay a lot for that, but everything is fine. So this episode and all future episodes will be 1080. There's a higher bit rate, so everything will look crystal clear. Everyone will be happy with this. And then over the next week or two, I will be upgrading the first three videos to 1080. So it doesn't matter if you watch on your television or on your phone, you'll have a great crisp viewing experience. It'll be awesome. I hold myself to a higher standard because of all of you. So thank you for writing in about that. The second biggest request was making the videos easier to share, which I dropped the ball on. That was my fault. So... The videos in the corresponding blog posts are now hosted on Wistia and can be shared and embedded pretty much anywhere. So go nuts, make it happen. Finally, the third request was to start showing off motion with a, a pretty large contingent of people specifically asking for kinetic typography tutorials. <laughs> so I've done that. Uh, it's, it's great, it looks amazing, it's a great effect, but it is a pretty deep topic, so we can do it. And I'm confident we can tackle it, but we may have to do it over the course of three or four episodes. So if we record three or four 15-minute episodes, that gives us enough time to cover the tools, what they do, how to use them, and then maybe come out with a 30 to 45-second project at the end. So I think that'll be the best way. I've started scripting it out. I think it'll work amazingly. So keep an eye out for that. That may start with episode six. So that'll be two weeks from the release of this episode. That's all for the requests. I just wanted to cover the top three, let you know that I am listening. I will be tailoring the podcast to the needs of the listeners, which is nice. So let's get to the topic at hand, and that is retiming in Final Cut Pro 10. I like to keep the explanations brief because you're all beautiful, intelligent people. So let's just break it down. There are two types of retiming, constant and variable speed. Constant speed applies a single value across an entire clip, and variable speed increases or decreases over time. The latter is what you might find in a Zack Snyder movie. So if you've ever seen maybe 300 or Watchmen, you know exactly what speed ramping is, even if you didn't know what it was called. So let's start with constant retiming since it's much more straightforward. Say you have a clip where a speed change wouldn't necessarily affect the narrative. Drone footage is actually perfect for this. I'm going to play back this clip right here and then we're going to retime it to make it faster. But let's see how it plays in regular speed. Not bad, that's kind of a sweeping view, it looks nice, but if we sped it up, it might get to the point a little bit quicker. So what we wanna do is, in your timeline, select the clip and then press Command-R to bring up the retime editor. You can also reach this area with even more options by clicking on the Retime button over here in the toolbar, but more on that later. The next thing we want to do is click the arrow next to 100%. Then you can choose whether you want the clip to be slow or fast, and then choose either a percentage if it's slower or a multiplier if it's faster. Let's speed this clip up two times and then see how it looks. I'm going to do that and then I'm gonna skip through the render process really quickly so we don't have to deal with that. 
Now if we play this clip back at 200% faster speed, it takes half the time and we get through the pan a little bit quicker and it looks nice, it looks really nice. If we take this next clip and press Command R and then set the speed of that to 50%, You'll notice that in addition to the clip doubling in length, the bar up here actually turns orange as well. If you don't dismiss these bars, it's a great way to see at a glance what's been sped up, which appears in blue right here, and what's been slowed down, which appears in orange right here. So if you have a long complex project with a lot of nested clips and secondary storylines and connected clips, you can see very quickly what you've done to them. There are two great ways to set a custom speed. So the first one involves grabbing the little handle right here at the end of the retime editor and just dragging left or right. This is great when you're trying to sync to a beat and you need a visual on how the clip should look. So no one really knows if we wanted to sync to this beat right here in the music, you would never know that 60% specifically would get you there. But dragging and dropping like this is a much quicker way to do that. The second way is essentially the same, but it has a super powered option built in. So what I'm going to do is reset the speed here by pressing Command Option R on my keyboard, and we'll see that we're back to 100%. Now with this clip still selected, I'm going to drop down here and then choose Custom. Here you can actually set the percentage, but notice this checkbox called Ripple right here. If you check this box during a slow motion effect, it will push all subsequent clips further down the timeline to accommodate the new longer duration. If, however, you leave it unchecked, it will still slow the clip to the speed you choose, but also maintain the current duration. You can trim it out to its full longer version or leave it as is. So let me show you how this works. So unchecked, I'm going to choose 50%. And we press enter, and it stays the same. See, the duration never changed. Let me undo this, and then I'm going to select Ripple, and now put 50%. Notice that it pushed all of these clips further down. So, if you need to slow down a clip, but keep the duration exactly the same, just uncheck Ripple. There's a lot of flexibility there. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. So far, all of this retiming we've done has kind of been a worst case scenario situation. You don't really want to apply slow or fast motion effects to clips shot in 24p. It just won't get you the best results. Final Cut handles high frame rate footage beautifully though, and that's what we'll be looking at next. So I wanna switch over to a project that I've been working on recently. Right here, I've aptly named it Slow Motion Footage. So the first thing I want you to note is that with this project selected over here in the inspector, the timeline frame rate is set to, for brevity's sake, 24p. But within here, we have a few clips. This one's 60p. This one is also 60p. This one is 120p. If we play this back, you'll notice that despite the mixed frame rates, it all looks the same. Final Cut only uses the frames it needs to make everything look awesome. So let's see. This is 24p. This is 60, and so is this. And it all looks relatively the same. 60 isn't any smoother, necessarily, than the 24p footage, so it all looks great. The awesome thing about retiming is that we can instruct Final Cut to play a clip back at its native speed, given the timeline settings. So each second of 60p footage on a 24p timeline would actually be 2.5 seconds which gives you a really nice slow motion effect. I'm gonna show you what I mean. So I'm going to select this clip right here and let me play it back just so you could see what it looks like. That's just a shot bot drilling into some material right there. That's at 60p. What you do is you click on the clip and then from the retime menu, we don't wanna play it any slower. What we wanna do is choose automatic speed, which will play the clip at 60p in a 24 timeline. So now you see we've slowed it down 40%, and I'm going to render this really quickly. And now when we play it back, you see we get this smooth as butter kind of look to the footage. It slowed down, but I'm gonna be honest and say there wasn't a lot going on here that was worth filming it in slow motion. That's where the 120p clip comes into play. And this is also where variable speed 
really, really comes in handy. So let me play back this 120p clip to show you what's exactly happening here. We basically have compressed air blowing all this dust away, but let's see it. Okay, that's pretty good, but that would look amazing in slow motion, which is exactly why I filmed it in 120p. So to do this, what we wanna do is isolate the area where we want the slow motion to take place. So using your skimmer, we want to kind of start right here at the beginning of the explosion and then press I on our keyboard to set an endpoint. You can also use the range tool here, but this is a little bit more efficient. And then we want to skim to where we want the slow motion to end and then press O. Now with this range selected where kind of the majority of this motion is happening, we want to go up to the retime window and then again, press automatic speed. You'll notice immediately that the middle of the clip is slowed down to 20%, which makes total sense since 24, the frame rate of our timeline, is 20% of 120, the frame rate of the clip. We also have these little semi-transparent parts right here, and Final Cut uses those to ramp us in and out of the transition. We can actually grab them and then drag them left or right. So the longer it is, the more gradual the transition is into the slow motion, and the shorter it is, the more abruptly we just go right into that slow motion effect. I kind of like it to slowly ramp in, so I'm gonna leave it right about there. You can actually choose the quality of the retime from the retime menu as well. So if we click anywhere, say we deselected our slow motion portion here, you can click anywhere on the orange bar to reselect it again, and then change it as you see fit. In this case, I wanna go back to the retime menu and then go down here to video quality. From here, you can choose normal, frame blending, and optical flow. We won't go into each of these because they're super in depth, but let me explain briefly what they do. So normal, which is your default setting, will just duplicate frames and insert them to create a slow motion effect. There's nothing too fancy here, but it's pretty effective. Frame blending will also duplicate frames, but as the name suggests, it blends them together for a slightly smoother motion and optical flow creates frames where they didn't previously exist, and that's based on the frame before and after, so it kind of interpolates frames. It's pretty amazing, actually. Let's play this back after I render it and see what this looks like now. Keep in mind, this is just with the normal setting. We haven't specified any other higher video quality. That is pretty awesome. I love slow motion. Everything looks better in slow motion. Based on the descriptions of the different types of video quality, it's tempting to just always choose optical flow and be done with it, but there are circumstances that benefit from all three types. In fact, on this clip, I actually prefer frame blending. The one downside to optical flow is that it has to analyze the entire clip's motion before it applies itself, then you render it. So it's super time consuming, but the results can often be rather stunning. I suggest you just play around with the various video qualities on clips and see what works best. Sometimes slow motion with water looks really weird with optical flow, but that might be kind of an effect that you're looking for, so give it a shot. Thank you for watching. Again, as always, if you found it useful, please give it a good rating on iTunes as it will help others find it somehow. Thanks again, fcp.co. And if you have any questions or something you'd like to see covered, you can reach out via my website, andrewgormley.com, or on Twitter, at darkdriving. I'll see you all in the next episode of The Primary Storyline.